Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Learn Physics, the show where I explain graduate level physics textbooks for people like you. Today we'll be going over chapter 3 of Classical Mechanics by Herbert Goldstein, talking about the central force problem. A central force is when two objects exert an attractive or repulsive force on one another that only depends on their distance. We're going to start general, and then we're going to look specifically at 1 over r squared forces. This is applicable to the universe we experience because gravity between two objects, like the Earth and the Moon, and the electric force between two charged objects, like a proton and an electron, are both 1 over r squared forces. A 1 over r squared force means a 1 over r potential. So what's the difference between a force and a potential? A force is what causes an object's velocity to change, whereas a potential is a landscape where objects roll downhill, or in the case of negative charges, roll uphill. As usual in this chapter, I will be throwing up a lot of equations. The equations are optional. You don't have to understand the equations in order to get the gist of the concepts. In this chapter, we'll be using two coordinates, r and theta. r is the distance between two objects, whereas theta is the angle of their position in their orbits. And remember, a coordinate with a dot on it means a rate of change. So r dot is the radial velocity. It's how fast the distance is changing. Theta dot is the angular velocity. It's how fast the angle is changing. Okay, let's begin. Section 3.1, the equivalent one-body problem. A central force problem has two objects, and because of Newton's third law, they both exert equal and opposite forces on each other, which means they're both moving. However, with some fancy math, we can model this as a fixed source and a single moving object under its influence. The mass of the single moving object is given by this formula. In some cases, this is a really good approximation for what really happens. Like when we have two objects that have extreme differences in their masses, like the Earth and the Sun. We can treat the Sun as being fixed in place, and the Earth as the single moving object orbiting around it. But in general, you can treat any two objects with a central force between them as if it were one fixed source and one object moving around it. The math comes out the same, so you might as well do the math in the way that's easier. Section 3.2, analyzing a particle near a fixed central source of force. This would be a three-dimensional problem, which would mean three coordinates. However, since angular momentum is conserved, we don't need three coordinates. Instead, we can have just r and theta, the distance between them and the angle around their orbit. In chapter two, we talked about cyclic coordinates leading to a conservation of generalized momentum. If we write the Lagrangian for the central force, we can see that it doesn't depend directly on theta. It depends on theta dot, but not theta, which means theta is cyclic and something is conserved. That conserved quantity is the angular momentum. And because a constant times r squared theta dot is conserved, a different constant times r squared theta dot is also conserved. What is that? It is the area swept out by the orbit over time. In the case of gravity, that's Kepler's second law, but it's also applicable to all central force potentials. If we do the Lagrange equation for r, we get this. Notice anything about that? There's no theta, nor is there any theta dot. This equation only has r and angular momentum. This is going to be important in the next section. And that constant there, that's the energy. What this means is that with any two-body problem with a potential that only depends on the distance, momentum and energy are conserved. Now I hear you saying, but we were taught in class that momentum and energy are conserved. Of course energy and momentum are conserved. Why are you telling me this? What I'm telling you is this is how we know energy and momentum are conserved. If we start from a position of saying, I don't know what's conserved, and then we do the math, we do the analysis, we deduce, we learn, we derive that energy and momentum are conserved. The section also simplifies the equations of motion to this, which can't be solved generally, but can be solved when you put in specific potentials. We'll come back to these later. Section 3.3 is the equivalent one-dimensional problem. So far in the video, we've talked about two-dimensional problems, 
where we have the distance, r, and the angle of the orbit, theta. However, because angular momentum is conserved, and we have this equation of motion that does not depend on theta, we can graph this, we can analyze it, as if it is a one-dimensional problem. We have the fixed source of the force, and the object's absolute distance away from it. We can ignore the angle altogether. So how do we analyze this? How do we plot an object's distance without any information about its angle? Well, we can do this by treating the angular momentum as if it is an outward pushing force, a centrifugal force. You know when you're driving down the road and you take a tight turn and it feels like you're being pushed away from the turn? We all know that that feeling is the car keeping us on the curve in centripetal force. But if we ignore the fact that we're turning and treat it as if we were going straight, there's a fictitious force, the centrifugal force, pushing us in the opposite direction. Centrifugal force may be fictitious, but we can write it mathematically in terms of the angular momentum and treat it like a real force. Its equation looks like this. So to analyze a central force problem in one dimension only, the R dimension, we have two components to the force. We have the attraction or repulsion from the central source, and we have the centrifugal force. These two components add together to give us an effective force. And if we take the derivative of the centrifugal force, we get a centrifugal component to the potential, which we can add to make an effective potential. As we know, energy is conserved. Ordinarily, energy is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. In the one-dimensional problem, the conserved energy is the kinetic energy plus the effective potential energy. This gives us an energy plot, which, at least for 1 over r squared forces, looks like this. If you've never seen an energy plot before, the function is the potential, in this case the effective potential. The energy is a constant line. The places where the energy intersects the potential are turning points, and you can think of the object as a ball rolling on the potential like a landscape between the turning points. It has to stay on that potential function, and it cannot go above the energy. From this graph, we can imagine three types of orbits. If the energy is above the maximum potential at large distances, this is an unbound orbit. The particle will come in, it will get close to the object, and then it will go out. And it will keep leaving forever because it will never encounter another turning point. In the example of gravity, this would be like an asteroid coming near Earth, swinging around, and then going out again, and never coming back, because it's traveling faster than the escape velocity. If the energy is lower than the far maximum of the potential, we can have a bound orbit, where the object goes back and forth between the close turning point and the far turning point. This is what we see in planets orbiting the Sun, and moons orbiting planets. They orbit in ellipses, with a closest point, called the periapse, and a farthest point, called the apoapse. The last interesting orbit is when the energy is equal to a maximum or a minimum of effective potential. This gives us circular orbits. If it's a maximum, that circular orbit is unstable, because a perturbation away from the central force will cause the object to continue moving away. If the perturbation is inward, then the object will go toward and then fly away because it has enough energy now to get over that maximum. At a minimum of effective potential, this is a stable circular orbit because a small perturbation away from that minimum keeps the object in a bound orbit. So here's an interesting observation. If the potential is 1 over r cubed or a higher power of r, then that term will dominate over the centrifugal potential at distance equals zero, which means the force, even with centrifugal force, becomes infinitely attractive. You might think, well, that never happens, of course, right? <coughs> Black holes. Now, what if the energy is lower than the minimum potential? What happens then? Well, in that case, the object doesn't exist. It would have absolute negative energy which isn't possible as far as we know. Section 3.4 is the Virial Theorem. Now this is something that came up in my physics education a lot, but I never understood it until I studied it for this video. The Virial Theorem is a statistical law that relates the average kinetic energy of particles to the average potential energy. 
It's most useful with large numbers of particles like in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, but it's also valuable when considering central forces and orbits. The chapter spends time deriving it mathematically, but the important thing is that the virial theorem is this. The average kinetic energy of a system of particles is equal to a half of the average potential energy. It's an equation that can be used as a tool and will come up later in this video. Section 3.5 is titled, How to Calculate the Shape of an Orbit, represented as theta as a function of r, the angle as a function of the distance between the objects. So remember the equations of motion we set aside earlier? If we combine those, we get this. This is theta as a function of r. And we can't solve it unless we know what v is, unless we know what the potential is. That's the whole section. They don't solve it because you can't solve it in general. You have to know what the specific potential is. Section 3.6, conditions for closed orbits. We already talked about how a circular orbit is when the energy is equal to a minimum or maximum in the effective potential. This occurs when the central force is attractive and exactly cancels out the centrifugal force. This obviously can't happen for a repulsive force because the centrifugal force is repulsive. So what happens if you take a stable circular orbit and you perturb it so that there's slightly more energy than that circular orbit? Well, that object is going to oscillate back and forth around the circular orbit. So the question is, does the orbit come back exactly to its original position or does it precess? Does the angle of that ellipse change with each orbit? This section goes into a lot of heavy math to prove Bertrand's theorem. The only central forces that lead to closed orbits with no precession are inverse square forces like gravity and electromagnetism and Hooke's law, the force of springs. Every other central force function, when you do the calculation, will not come back to its original point. That's actually one of the major ways Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, was tested. It was already known that the planet Mercury did not have a closed orbit, but it precessed. Mercury's ellipse around the sun changed a few degrees with every revolution. General relativity accounted for that by having gravity not quite be an inverse square force. I actually had to do that problem for a homework assignment. In section 3.7, we look at the Kepler problem. Finally, we are zeroing in on the inverse square law, the forces of gravity and electrostatics that we're familiar with from our everyday lives. The force is equal to minus a constant over r squared, and the potential is equal to minus the constant over r. Now that we know the potential, we can do that nasty theta integral, which I'm pretty sure I had to do as a homework assignment. When we do that, this is our orbit equation, which, if you know your equations, is obviously the equation of a conic section. If you put the right values into this equation, you can get circles, ellipses, parabolas, or hyperbolas. In this general conic section equation, E is the eccentricity and C is a scaling constant. If the eccentricity is greater than one, the orbit is a hyperbola. If the eccentricity is equal to one, the orbit is a parabola. If the eccentricity is less than one, the orbit is an ellipse. And if the eccentricity is equal to zero, the orbit is a circle. From the eccentricity equation, we can derive that the energy of a circular orbit is equal to this. The section then goes on to prove this, which I would normally leave out, but it brings back concepts that we've used before, so here it is. The energy of an orbit is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. In the case of a circular orbit, the kinetic energy and potential energy each are constant. This means that the virial theorem, which says the average kinetic energy is equal to one half the average potential energy, is true. It simply describes the kinetic energy and the potential energy. Because if something is constant, it is equal to its average. This means the energy is a function of the distance of the orbit. Because for a circular orbit, the force has to be equal and opposite the centrifugal force, we can find the distance of the orbit in terms of the angular momentum. And when we write the energy in terms of the angular momentum, 
we find the same relation we got from the eccentricity. Isn't math just so cool? The section then derives the semi-major axis of the ellipse. That is half the distance from end to end of the ellipse. It plugs it into the eccentricity and rewrites r as a function of the semi-major axis and the eccentricity and the angle. If you're a geometry nut, maybe this is familiar to you. The velocity of the object in orbit is given by this equation. It has a component that is radial, that is how fast it's moving toward or away from the source, and a component that's angular, that is how fast it is moving in a direction perpendicular to the source. The chapter uses tables and plots to show that in an elliptical orbit, the velocity is fast when it's close to the source and slow when it's far away from the source. And it's getting dark out, so I'm gonna have to film the rest of this another day. All right, I'm back. It's not quite as sunny today, but at least it's light out. All right, now where were we? Oh yeah, 3.8, motion and time in the Kepler problem. So what is the Kepler problem? Johannes Kepler was an astronomer before Newton who observed patterns in the motions of the planets around the sun. He was the one who figured out that the planets move in elliptical orbits. In the context of this chapter, it is an inverse square force with a fixed source, the sun, and objects that move around it, planets, in elliptical orbits. So we've gotten distance as a function of angle in a previous section. What about distance as a function of time? After all, physics is all about predicting where something is going to be at a specific moment in time. Well, it turns out this is really hard because you have to integrate this equation and then invert it. Now, I reread the chapter a couple of times because I thought they were going to solve this problem, but they just didn't. Instead, they used that integral to find different quantities. By substituting in the conic section equation for r and integrating over the angle, we can find the period of revolution, the time it takes for an object to get back to its starting point. The equation we get is Kepler's third law. The period squared is equal to the semi-major axis cubed. Semi-major axis, if you don't know, is half of the long distance across the ellipse. They also calculate the area, which is pi times the semi-major axis times the semi-minor axis. Section 3.9 talks about the Runge lens vector. Now it's kind of hard to imagine what this is, but it is a vector that is conserved in elliptical orbits. Its equation is this, and if we look at our ellipse, it points in the direction from the central force to the closest edge of the ellipse, the periapse. So what's the point of this? Well, because there's a conserved quantity, we can derive stuff with it mathematically. The book uses it to, once again, derive the orbit equation, which is the same as the other two things we've found. This isn't telling us anything new, but it is corroborating things we found in a different way. And in science, that's evidence. From this equation, we can get an expression for the magnitude of the Runge lens vector. So what is the Runge lens vector physically? Well, it's hard to say, but it is something we can use to make our math easier. Section 310 and section 311 are about scattering in a central force. These are significant enough that I have decided to do a separate video on scattering, so subscribe to be notified when that comes out. And section 3.12 talks about the three-body problem, which, by the way, is the name of a really good sci-fi book. It's not the greatest in terms of characters, but for ideas and crazy sci-fi science, it is magnificent. So if you're the kind of person who watches videos like this, you will most likely love the book, The Three-Body Problem. So what is the three-body problem in physics? Well, up until now, we've looked at a two-body problem, which is two objects exerting a force on each other that only depends on their distance. A three-body problem says, what if we add another one to the picture? In this case, it makes things more complicated because each object exerts a force on each other in a different direction, and you have to add them together as vectors. And because each object is moving, the direction of the net force changes over time. For one and two body problems, the equations of motion can be integrated to give closed form solutions for the motions of the objects, which is what we've been talking about for the rest of this chapter. With three bodies, we can't do that. Well, most of the time. Occasionally we can. There are some pretty cool counterexamples. One example is when you have three ellipses with three objects orbiting so that they always all are on a line. 
Another is if you have three angled ellipses such that the triangle you draw between the objects is always an equilateral triangle. You can have stable three-body problems if one of the objects is far enough away from the others that the other two behave as if they're one object, such as if you have a binary star with a planet far away from them, or if you have a planet and a moon orbiting a star, or if you have planets at vast distances from one another orbiting the same star. Of special interest to humans is a system that has two highly massive objects, but a third object that has comparatively almost zero mass, like a space shuttle orbiting the Earth, which is orbiting the Sun. There are places in an orbit like this where the pull of the Sun and the pull of the Earth and the centrifugal force all cancel each other out, giving points where a small object will remain stable relative to the Earth and the Sun. These points are called Lagrange points, and they're given the labels L1 through L5. L1 is partway between the Earth and the Sun. This is where the Earth pulls on the satellite, canceling out enough of the Sun's pull on the satellite so that it orbits with the same speed as the Earth. L2 is on the dark side of the Earth, where the Earth's gravity adds to the Sun's gravity to increase the speed of the orbit, keeping the object on the dark side of the Earth. L3 is on the far side of the Sun, in almost the same place where the Earth would be if it were over there. L4 is in Earth's orbit ahead of the Earth, and L5 is in Earth's orbit behind the Earth. Of these five Lagrange points, only L4 and L5 are stable. The rest, any satellite put in those positions, will have to make micro-adjustments in order to stay there. The Earth-Moon system also has five Lagrange points in similar positions. And that's it for chapter three. We analyzed everything there is to know about central force problems. That is a force between two objects that only depends on their distance, not their angle in relation to each other. Such problems can be reduced to one dimensional problems if we treat centrifugal force as if it is a real force. The Virial theorem suggests that the average kinetic energy of a system is equal to half the average potential energy. We looked at how to calculate the shape of an orbit, whether it closes back on itself or it processes with successive revolutions. We found that in an inverse square law, orbits are like conic sections, hyperbolas, parabolas, ellipses, and circles. We found the period and area of elliptical orbits. I'm going to devote a whole bonus video on scattering in a central force because that is something that is used all over the place in experimental physics and is incredibly important. And finally, we talked about the difficulties with the three-body problem. Chapter 4 is about the kinematics of rigid body motion, that is, solid objects. So subscribe if you want to be notified when that comes out. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Don't forget to like. And if you think this type of analysis is valuable, you can support me on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.